Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the study of antiquity and the Middle Ages. As always, I am your host, Nick Barksdale, and today we're joined once again by a very special guest, and that is Spencer McDaniel. The interesting aspect of this episode is going to be something that I think many of you are going to find interesting and you're going to enjoy. Many of you have watched an episode that I did not too long ago on Easter Sunday, no less, on the darkening age, the Christian destruction of the classical world by none other than our guest, Catherine Nixie. And so for fun and for something different, and because I believe certain viewpoints need to be heard, and I'm not opposed to showing differing viewpoints, I wanted Spencer to come on and almost offer, as always, a polite and thorough form of rebuttal. And so without further ado, Spencer, would you tell us a little bit about yourself and make an introduction? Hello, I just finished my third year double majoring in history and classical studies at Indiana University Bloomington. I am going to be applying to PhD programs probably in um, towards the end of this year. That's the current plan. I'm very passionate about ancient history. I've been studying it since elementary school. I have a website called talesoftimesforgotten.com where I write articles about topics related to the ancient world. I've been writing on this website since November 2016. And as of the time I'm giving this interview, I've written 343 articles published. And to my subscribers, before we get started, check out the links in the video description below and really take advantage of the articles that Spencer has written. I'm honestly quite the fan myself. Other guests who have been on this channel really do enjoy what Spencer is trying to do, and I think many of you will as well. I've been sharing them to my Facebook page, and honestly, they're getting great reviews, lots of clicks, some heated arguments, but honestly, I mean, what else do we love to do other than argue about history? So without further ado, we're going to jump right in. For this episode, because I think this is important, let's talk about your educational differences, your background and how it varies from Catherine Nixie and is important in this discussion. Yeah, so I think that um, my perspective and her perspective are influenced by us coming from very different um, upbringings. Um, it sounds from, as I understand it, uh, Nixie comes from a very conservative Catholic upbringing, whereas I came from a liberal Protestant upbringing. And so she talks in her interview with you, and she's talked previously about how Growing up, she was taught this narrative of there was the, the evil Romans who persecuted Christians, and then they converted to Christianity, and the world became a much better place. Whereas I, growing up, was taught pretty much the exact opposite narrative, that there was the glorious Roman Empire where they made all these wonderful scientific and technological advances. And then there were the dark ages when the evil Catholic church persecuted science and people's minds were enslaved to papistry. It was a time of ignorance and superstition. So growing up, um, Nixie kind of learned that the narrative she was taught wasn't exactly true. Uh, but I've also learned that the narrative I was taught wasn't exactly true either. And so I wouldn't say I'm 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 certainly not a fan of the of the Catholic Church, but I recognize that there um, is more complexity to it uh, than what I was taught. Um, another difference is that, as I understand it, it sounds like Nixie's degree is in classics, and her background is primarily in Roman literature. Um, my degree that I'm that I'm almost finished with now. Um, is in classics and history. And I'm generally more interested in the historical aspects than the literary aspects. And so I'm coming from kind of a more historically focused angle of, um, I've taken classes on medieval history. And so I maybe have a bit of a, a different perspective on certain things. Religiously speaking, I'm an agnostic, but I recognize that religion may provide meaning and purpose to others. I imagine I'm about to get a long answer with this question. And so I wanted to ask right now, point blank for our subscribers who may not stick with us through the whole video. When it comes to Catherine Nixie and her framing in the darkening age, her viewpoints on that, where do you disagree? So I think there are two main 
overarching facets of her framing of the issue that I disagree with. Um, one, and she's, I noticed that she's much more, care, she's more careful in the actual text of the book itself, but in terms of like the title and the, um, the subtitle and the description, um, it's framed as the Christian destruction of the classical world. And one issue I have with this is the framing of Christianity as something that's foreign and inherently different and antagonistic to so-called classical civilization. When in reality, I would argue that Christianity is both a product of and a part of the classical world. So Jesus lived in Galilee, which was ruled at the time by Herodes Antipas, a client ruler for the Roman Empire. He was crucified in Judea, which was a Roman province, under the orders of Pontius Pilate, a Roman prefect from a well-known Roman family. Um, the early spread of Christianity was mainly inside the Roman Empire. All the writings of the New Testament were originally written in Koine Greek. Uh, the New Testament includes quotations from works of Greek literature, at least four. Um, Acts 17, 27 through 28 quotes the Kretika, which is attributed to Epimenides of Knossos and, uh, um, and also Eratus of Solois didactic poem Phenomena, line five. Acts 26, 14 portrays God as directly quoting to Paul from Aeschylus's tragedy Agamemnon, line um, 1624, where he says, um, why, um, why do you kick against the goads? Um, 1 Corinthians um, 1533 quotes a Greek proverb that's also found in Menanthros' comedy, Thais. Um, Titus um, 1.12 quotes the Credica of Epimenides again. For some reason, early Christians seem to really like the Credica uh, because it's quoted in the New Testament, not once, but twice. Um, and then the, the key concept of the logos in Christianity comes from Greek philosophy. Um, it was written about by the Greek philosopher Heracletus of Ephesus in the fifth century BCE. And then Christianity existed in the Roman Empire for almost as long as there was a Roman Empire for it to exist in. So I would argue that Christianity was never really capable of destroying classical civilization because it was inherently a part of that civilization. Another disagreement I have with Nixie is Although she certainly acknowledges that early Christians disagreed about a lot of things, uh, she makes a point of they rapidly disagreed with each other about all kinds of stuff. I don't think this is entirely reflected in the way that she frames her narrative, um, in that she frames it in a way that I don't think fully recognizes the internal diversity within Christianity. So there are basically only two things that all Christians in antiquity agreed on. One is there's some kind of deity, and the other is Jesus was really awesome for some reason or another. Um, and the vast majority of people in antiquity who identified as Christians did not believe all the theological claims that were eventually declared orthodoxy. Um, and even among those who did fulfill a retroactive definitions of orthodoxy, there was widespread disagreement over all kinds of issues, including the merits of classical Greek and Roman literature, philosophy, and art. So for instance, the church father, Eustinus Magistis, writing in the second century CE, um, developed this idea of the spermata to logu, or the seeds of the word. And he said that um, the, these seeds of the word were, were sown long before the coming of Christ and that Greek philosophers like Socrates and Plato were unknowingly influenced by Christian teachings. Um, and so this was kind of a way of appropriating Greek philosophy so that Christians could use it. And then there were of course Christians who argued that Greek philosophy and literature are bad. So for instance, um, the most famous example is Tertullianus of Carthage who writes in his De Prescriptione Hyretico Corum uh, chapter seven, what indeed has Athens to do with Jerusalem? What concord is there between the academy and the church? What between heretics and Christians? But yet um, Tertullianus represents only one perspective and not actually the perspective that seems to be, have been the most dominant. Um, another perspective is represented by Origenes of Alexandria, who according to his student, um, his student Gregorius Thaumaturgos, 
um, writes about his teaching policies in his Panegyric 13, as translated by David T. Runia. Borgeganis considered it right for us to study philosophy in such a way that we read with utmost diligence all that has been written, both by the philosophers and the poets of old, rejecting nothing and repudiating nothing, except only what had been written by the atheists who deny the existence of God or providence. And by the atheists, he's probably referring to the Epicureans who weren't actually atheists by the modern definition, but early Christians like to call them atheists a lot. And so over time, we have kind of a general consensus, I, or consensus is maybe the wrong word since there is a lot of disagreement here, but there's kind of a general perspective that becomes the most common um, that lasts throughout the Middle Ages, that it is good to study ancient Greek and Roman philosophy and literature, as long as you don't let it distract you too much from studying scripture. Of course, there's disagreement about how much is too much, uh, which is another issue that we could get into. But um, the fact is, there are these there are a lot of different perspectives. And so, when she frames it as though Christians have um, this inherent antagonism towards Greek and Roman literature and philosophy, I don't think that's entirely accurate. Certainly, some Christians have an antagonism to it, and certainly. Um, the majority of Christians have some serious disagreements with a lot of what's in Greek and Roman literature and philosophy, but it's not, I don't think it's a matter of them being inherently opposed. And so now I want to talk about book burnings, destruction of non-Christian literature. And so this is what I want to ask. One, did that actually happen? Two, do we know even what extent that happened? And three, what works would have been targeted in the first place? Yeah, so this is a great question. It is true that Christian authorities in some, or that Christians in some cases did try to destroy some specific kinds of writings, but there was never any organized attempt to destroy classical writings in general. Um, and the and interestingly enough, the attempts to suppress certain kinds of writings generally were not especially successful. The first kind of writing that Christians attempted to destroy were magical texts. Um, and attempts at suppressing magical writings were more or less a complete failure. Um, we have literally reams of surviving ancient Greek and Roman magical texts, like the Greek magical papyri from Egypt. Um, these are largely understudied, unfortunately. But not only um, did these texts survive, Christian individuals um, actually continued to read these texts, and they even produced Christian magical texts of their own. Um, I know that um, Andrew Mark Henry, who does the Religion for Breakfast um, YouTube channel, um, actually specializes in late antique magical writing. So he might be a good person to talk to about that subject. Another kind of writing that Christians tried to suppress were Christian writings that they deemed heretical, except attempts at suppressing these writings weren't especially successful either because there are lots of so heretical Christian writings that have survived. Um, some through later medieval copies like the Gospel of Peter, which survives through an eighth or ninth century um, manuscript um, buried with an Egyptian monk, but others through ancient copies such as the works of the Nag Hammadi Library. And then the third kind of text that um, Christians in some cases tried to destroy were anti-Christian polemics. And here they're somewhat successful in that no works of this kind have survived independently, but their arguments have in many cases inadvertently been preserved by the Christian apologists who responded to them. So the Greek, for instance, the Greek controversialist Kelsos wrote an anti-Christian polemic titled The True Word sometime around 170 CE or thereabouts. And the Christian apologist Origenes of Alexandria, whom I actually mentioned earlier, wrote a nearly word for word or a nearly word for word response to everything that Kelsos said um, in around 248 CE titled Against Kelsos, in which he directly quotes what scholars estimate may be more than three quarters of Kelsos's original treaties. And so he's responding to this treatise to argue everything Kelsos says is wrong, but he inadvertently preserves 
the vast majority of what Kelso says. Um, the reason why so many texts have been lost um, isn't so much the result of deliberate censorship and more the result of inevitable gradual loss of writings over time. Uh, and this is something that Nixie actually acknowledges both in her book and in her interview with you. Um, and there was, there was no printing press in antiquity. So the only way that works written in antiquity could be copied was by hand which was extremely laborious, time consuming, and often expensive. And so over time, manuscripts are inevitably destroyed by decay, insects, um, water damage, accidental fires, all kinds of things. Um, and if a work wasn't copied, it was soon lost forever. And so, as I mentioned, this is something that Nixie actually um, points out both in her book and, her, and in her interview. Where I disagree with Nixie is in her claim that Christians were totally uninterested in reading ancient Greek and Roman literature and philosophy. I think that this is arguably true for some specific genres. For instance, there was very little interest in lyric poetry. Um, in her interview with you, Nixie mentions Catullus. Um, virtually no one in the Middle Ages was reading Catullus. His poems survived the Middle Ages in a single poorly copied manuscript that showed up in Verona in around the year 1300 with a bunch of scribal errors. And that manuscript has been lost and all the surviving manuscripts of Catullus's work are based on that one manuscript. Um, there are, however, works that medieval Christians were deeply interested in and perhaps um, you might even say outright devoted to. Um, for instance, most ancient works written in the Greek language that have survived to the present day survived because they were copied for educated Greek-speaking Christians of elite backgrounds living in the Byzantine Roman Empire. And the Byzantines were very, very interested in Platonic philosophy. So as a result, every single work known to have ever been credibly attributed to Plato in antiquity has survived along with other works that Plato definitely didn't write, but that are attributed to him. Um, the Byzantines were also very, very interested in the Homeric epics. So as a, as a result, we have a whole bunch of surviving manuscripts of the Iliad and the Odyssey, and they not only preserved the poems themselves, but also ancient commentaries on the poems known as scolia. Um, and they also wrote and compiled commentaries of their own. Most famously, Greek scholar Epstathios, who was an archbishop of the city of Thessaloniki in the 12th century, had access to an astounding repository of older commentaries and critical resources, which he used to compile his own exhaustive commentaries on the Iliad and the Odyssey that were seen as authoritative for um, many hundreds of years. And the Byzantines were also very, very interested in ancient rhetoric. So they copied a lot of authors like Demosthenes, Aeschines, Socrates, um, Hyperides, Ilias, Aristides, um, Plutarchus of Chironea, and so on, um, who aren't studied as much, I think, today in classics courses, but they were very um, influential because they were in, during the Middle Ages because they were very interested in those kinds of works. Um, they were also very, very interested in medical texts. Um, so the single Greek author with the largest surviving corpus is actually Galenos of Pergamon, who was a medical writer um, who lived in the late second and early third century CE. And you're never going to encounter Galenos of Pergamon in a classics course because he wrote about medicine. His writings aren't exactly literary. Um, and so the main context in which you'd be reading Galenos today would be if you're a historian, especially if you're interested in the history of medicine. But they copied a lot of works by Galenos of Pergamon. And so medieval Christians obviously couldn't copy everything, but they copied certain works that they thought were important or interesting. And now I want to talk about a fundamental aspect of the Darkening Age, and that is the Christian destruction of classical antiquities. And so I want to ask now, did Christians really try to destroy aspects of ancient Greek and Roman art? Early Christians did, in some cases, destroy um, works of ancient Greek and Roman art, or what we would consider art. 
Um, but it's interesting to note that iconoclasm was far from a uniquely Christian phenomenon. The Romans destroyed statues of so-called bad emperors like Caligula and Nero. And by the time of Constantine the first, iconoclasm was a well-worn political tradition. Furthermore, it's interesting to note that in some cases, Christians actually displayed works or displayed Greek and Roman statues as art. Notably, when Constantine I established Constantinople as Nova Roma or New Rome in um, 330 CE, he built this enormous forum in the center of the city known as the Forum of Constantine, in which he put dozens of statues of Greek and Roman deities that he'd collected from temples um, on public display. And many of these statues actually remained on display until the sack of Constantinople by the Knights of the Fourth Crusade in 1204. Thus, for nearly a thousand years, statues of so-called pagan deities remained on public display in the very heart of the largest city in Christendom. Meanwhile, it's interesting to note that Christians continued the traditional religious practice of venerating images, only instead of worshiping um, idola or idols of Greek deities, they started venerating um, ikones or icons of Jesus, the Virgin Mary, and various saints. And Christian artists drew heavily on classical iconography for inspiration. For instance, our standard image of Jesus with long flowing hair and a beard uh, first developed in around the late 4th century CE and is clearly based on earlier Greek depictions of male deities, particularly Zeus, Asclepius, and Serapis. And this was actually recognized at the time. Um, interestingly, a fragment of a lost work written in the early 6th century CE by the Greek writer Theodorus Anagnostis records a miracle story set in the year 465 CE in which an icon painter paints Jesus's hair just a little too much like Zeus. So God punishes him by causing his hand to wither. Um, and in some cases, Christians actually came to venerate Greek statues themselves. In the 18th century, um, Greek peasants at the site of Lepsis venerated an ancient caryatid, which they believed represented Saint Dimitra, which is the modern Greek form of Demeter, um, who they believed controlled the harvests and had a daughter who was abducted by a malicious Turk. Uh, and the veneration of the statue ended in um, 1801 when the Englishman Edward Daniel Clark carried off the statue despite the Eleusinian villagers' attempts to stop him. And the statue is now in the Fitzwilliam Museum in England. And so now I want to come to pagan temples. Were pagan temples attacked, defaced, and sometimes destroyed by Christians? In some cases, Christians did destroy so-called pagan temples, such as the Temple of Apollon at Delphi in um, 390 CE and the Serapeon of Alexandria in 391 CE. More interesting, however, in my opinion, are the cases where Christians maintained old temples so that they could use them as churches. For instance, the Parthenon on the Athenian Acropolis was originally built in the 5th century BCE as a temple to the Greek goddess Athena, who was known as Parthenos, which means virgin. But in the late 6th century CE, it was converted into a Christian church dedicated to Mary, the mother of Jesus, who is also known as Parthenos. Um, so interestingly, um, the Byzantinist Anthony Calvelis argues in his book, The Christian Parthenon, Classicism and Pilgrimage, in Byzantine Athens, published in 2009 by Cambridge University Press, that the Parthenon actually became far more important as a Christian church and pilgrimage site during the Middle Ages than it ever was as a pagan temple during antiquity. Um, and one of the best preserved ancient Greek temples is the Temple of Hephaestus in the Athenian Agora, because it was converted into a Christian church ded dedicated to St. Georgios Akamatis, in the 7th century CE, and it remained continuously in use as a church until 1834, after the founding of the modern Greek nation state, when it was converted into a museum. So it has never fallen into ruins because it's been in continuous use ever since antiquity. 
Um, and similarly, the Pantheon in Rome was originally built as a temple to all the deities, hence the name, um, but it was converted into a Christian church dedicated to St. Mary and the Martyrs in 609 CE, and it's remained continuously in use as a church even today. And now I want to talk about probably one of the most brought up topics in any ancient history forum, and that is the tragic destruction of the Library of Alexandria. Right now across the world, as people watch this, I'm sure you're already starting to get out your handkerchiefs for your tears. But with that being said, I want to ask, did Christians deliberately destroy the Library of Alexandria? The answer to that question is no. So um, what really happened is in 391 CE, a group of Christians led by the Bishop Theophilus of Alexandria destroyed the Serapeon, which was a temple to the Greco-Egyptian god Serapis that at one point held a large collection of scrolls, some of which may have, it may have possibly been used as a, um, an additional repository of scrolls from the Library of Alexandria, or it may have been an entirely separate library from the beginning. But in any case, it's very unlikely that those scrolls were still in the Serapan at the time that it was destroyed because there's a writer named Ammianus Marcellinus who visited Alexandria shortly before the Serapan's destruction. And he speaks of the Serapan's library in the past tense. And he makes it sound like it had been destroyed long ago, which suggests that there probably weren't probably wasn't a huge collection of scrolls in there at the time. There are also multiple surviving accounts of the destruction of the Serapan, none of which mention anything at all about books or scrolls, which is especially interesting when you consider that one of these accounts comes from a pagan philosopher named Eunapius um, in his Lives of the Philosophers and so Sophists. And he was very um, vehemently anti-Christian and he was very um, much in favor of the Greek and Roman um, literary and philosophical tradition. And so if Christians really destroyed a large collection of Greek and Roman literary works at the time that they destroyed the um, Serapan, we would expect Eunapius to make a big deal about it. We would think that he would talk about this at length, but Instead, he doesn't say anything, um, which kind of suggests that there probably wasn't a very large collection of scrolls in the Serapan in 391. Then, of course, the classical library of Alexandria, the um, Ptolemaic library, had ceased to exist long before that. So we don't know exactly when the uh, Ptolemaic library of Alexandria ceased to exist, but we know that in 272 CE, um, the forces of the Emperor Aurelian um, utterly destroyed the Brukian quarter of Alexandria, where the library was located. So if the library still existed at that point, it was almost certainly destroyed then. And then we know that if later in, in 291 CE, the forces of the Emperor Diocletian destroyed the Brukian quarter again. And so if it somehow managed to survive the destruction by Aurelian, it almost certainly didn't survive the destruction by Diocletian. Um, and so there probably wasn't a, um, the Ptolemaic Library of Alexandria almost certainly did not exist um, by the time that Christians were in any position where they could have destroyed it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today at the Study of Antiquity and the Middle Ages. As always, I have been your host, Nick Barksdale, and we were joined today by Spencer McDaniel from the awesome blog, Tales of Times Forgotten, to lead us through another interesting episode on the past and all of its complexity in a very thorough, and in this case, also very respectful way that slightly rebuttals the views of another person. And so I really enjoyed this. I can't wait to do another episode on something similar to this. Comment your thoughts below. Be sure to check out the links in the video description. It's going to take you to the blog itself and really take advantage of all the awesome things that Spencer is doing to help people like me and you better understand the subjects that we all love. And without further ado, Spencer, thank you so much for coming on the show today. You're welcome. I was glad to be here.